Hello everyone, I am Bill Harris and this is Life Questions. Welcome to today's program. We hope that you will be inspired by the Word of God which provides us with modern day 21st century perspective on life. And that's because God's Word is eternal. If you don't believe it, stay with us for the next 30 minutes. We have answers to the questions sent to us by you, our viewers. And we are joined today by a panel of local ministers who have been praying and researching God's Word for special insights into today's program. So let's meet them today. First, we have Associate Pastor Bob Warren of Shekinah Temple in St. Mary's, followed by Pastor Patrick uh, Kamler of Westminster Church, Christian Church, that is, Westminster Christian Church. Then Pastor Greg Fox of Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Church and Rawson New Hope United Methodist Church. Rounding off our panel today is Pastor Mark Bird. He is the state chairman of Revive Ohio, and we're happy to have you all with us, gentlemen. You know, we've got questions here that have been sent in by young people, <clears throat> a lot of them teens. We, let's start with um, a survey from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Students there <clears throat> have recognized anxiety as being listed number one, the number one issue for students today, anxiety. Uh, it appears that social media, the inability to escape it, and the constant comparisons were to blame for increasing anxiety among teens. We know, too, that at, at the taping of this program, um, uh, what, Facebook, Facebook has come under some scrutiny now because of the, some of the things that they have allowed to be displayed uh, involving teens. Uh, what do you have to say about um, the contributions of media, everything else for that matter, to where teens are with anxiety today. Uh, anybody want to talk? Take, take the lead on that first. I could. I just uh, think that, you know, teens and everybody needs to limit their media, social media. Uh, right now, it's, I mean, every time you turn on the TV, it's negative, and you turn on Facebook or Instagram, whatever your, you know, social media is, there's always the negativity. And, you know, the Apostle Paul, warned him in uh, Philippians chapter four, you know, he said to think on these things, meditate on these things. And uh, I think we need to guard our hearts. We need to guard our minds and we need to limit ourselves because if, if we're just taking that constantly, we're gonna be you know, worried, we're gonna be depressed, we're gonna be angry, we're gonna be all these different things that the world's throwing out there right now, Bill. Yeah, and, and if we take what you just said and, and, and put that in a in the context of teenagers, it's probably worse, wouldn't you say, Pastor Kamala? Yeah, it would. In fact, I would even go a step further with that. And I look at this as someone who, who has had their own personal struggles with anxiety. I would almost look at it, and I've looked at it in my past, as a temptation. Hmm. And I think that's a, for me anyway, that was a helpful way to look at it as a temptation because you can't always control when you'll feel anxiety because you can turn off the media, you can turn off all these things, you can, you can get into a prayer closet by yourself, but you can still have anxious thoughts. You can still have that stuff come into you. So when you do that, how do you respond? And it's helped me, and I think it would help other people to look at it as a temptation. And God tells us in his word in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there is no temptation that is uncommon to man, that he will provide a way out of that temptation. So it involves kind of changing around your, your, your thought processes because media is going to do what media does and there's so much of it out there but you can control what you think about it you can control how much you take in and as you start to do that and you start to take captive your thoughts because uh, Paul, yeah. Paul writes about that in first Corinthians as well you can start to see changes in how you approach things and that when you do have anxiety you can take it captive you can say no I, I, I refuse to feel this way I'm going to think about the things that are that are good and true and holy and noble and focus on those things mm -hmm. instead of what is going on in the world today because there will be another crisis tomorrow I assure you but God is the same yesterday today and forever okay pastor Kamler, uh, uh, he alluded to the fact that in many cases that the problem is not necessarily the environment but the problem still may be inside you regardless of what's happening in the environment Absolutely. you agree yeah, and to tether off what Pastor Bob shared, you know, in Philippians 4, what Paul, he absolutely dire directly addressed anxiety, right? So it's not something that uh, has been anything new. 
It's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. But anxiety was addressed even by the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, verse 6. He said, be anxious for nothing, mm -hmm. but by all things through prayer and supplication, make your requests known unto God. And my thing is this, like, it's not that we won't be tempted to suffer from anxiety, but what I think Paul's encouraging the church to do is to take those and make them request to God. When you are anxious, where do you go? I think yeah, that's really the yeah. more important thing that we need to address today is when we do get anxious, right? Because like you said, you can lay everything down, set it aside, but still suffer with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So when you suffer, what do you do from there? You lay it down, you take that and make it a request and make it known unto yeah. God and he will help us. How can we put this in, in teenage language, Pastor Fox? I mean, because uh, what, what you're saying is all good and I'm sure the adults get it. I'm not so sure that teens mm. can latch on to that. But how, do, how do we get to them, minister to them uh, at their level and get this across? Because they're really experiencing, experiencing some anxiety. Well, they are and, and the adults as well as their peers put pressure on the teens as far as, you know, we expect you to be a great athlete. We expect you to be able to do this. We expect mm -hmm. you to sing. We expect you to perform on, on every level, of, no matter what they're involved in. And in the end, we have to try to re reassure them that these people that are, have expectations on them, and I know a lot of times as parents and adults, we, we're hoping for the best for them. But on the same token, they're only going to answer to one person in the end. And if we can get the children to realize, the teenagers to understand that in the end, God's the only one that we have to please. We have to present ourselves to God in an acceptable way and live his life. So when things start to get to you, like, like, like Patrick, excuse me, Pastor Patrick said, you can lay everything down, but if you don't step into the word and open your heart and let God talk to you, listen to him and guide you, you're gonna have a very hard time getting rid of those anxieties. Yeah. So we need to do our best as adults and pastors and, and peers to let them know that it's okay to step back and stop. You don't have to be in 14 different travel athletic leagues and, <laughs> and 14 different choirs and, and be an A student all the time. But you, you can step back and spend a little time with Jesus Christ and involve yourself in the Word. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that, that a student, and well, even adults for that matter, but a student can sometimes feel that they have to please others. That can be... It may not be a big, big deal to anybody around this table, but that can be a big deal with a kid. When in point of fact, God says that, that it, you can do something as simple as give a cup of cold water to somebody in my name, and that pleases him. So God's not a big deal in terms right. of how to please God. Right. And you were saying we, we, God's the one we need to please. Exactly. It's not others. And, uh, but I guess it's just not that easy for them to accept that. You are going to speak, Pastor Cameron? Well, I, I think it's so hard for kids of that age to really have a variety of opportunities to kind of see where they sit individually on things because they're they're involved in team sports and and they're in classes and we're the people and there's so much of you know and I, I go back to my experiences as a teenager a long time ago <laughs> and there was an element of you do certain things and you act a certain way because that's how your friends are acting and that's how you know mm -hmm. you can you can think you're you know, unique like everyone else, but in some form or fashion, you're probably doing and acting certain ways because your friends are acting the same way. And I think that's, uh, that, that makes it difficult to maybe hear something as far as what you should do individually. And it might, I would hope it would be encouraging that maybe you aren't someone who is struggling with anxiety or with depression, but maybe you feel like you should because everyone else around you is struggling with that. And maybe that's a call for you. And if you're a, we got these from FCA students, you know, perhaps that's a, that's a call for you to be the minister in that situation that, hey, look, you don't have to feel like this. You don't have to be struggling with uh, addiction and anxiety and depression and all that kind of stuff. Like there is a way out, there is a way out. And his name is Jesus Christ and, and create an avenue to do that there. But it, it, it's a struggle to get through that. And I think the we would be doing a disservice if we said, oh, there's no struggle. You just rely on God and everything else will take care of itself. No, you're going to have to you're going to have to put up a fight because what opposes you is going to fight right back. Yeah. But you can get through that with God's help and you can get to the other side of it. And, and we have all done that long time ago, but we've all done it. Just the simple thing of uh, the pressure to succeed whether academically, 
uh, athletically, whatever the case may be, or, or just one-upsmanship <laughs> right. with your peers, right. Right. you know, that kind of thing uh, is what they have to arm themselves against. It, it would seem like what we really need in our churches, too, is uh, more mentorship. Yes. Yeah. Of course, the Christian version of that is discipleship where we're leading them into the Word of God and, and giving them all kinds of positive scriptures. Any, any scripture that comes to mind that you'd like to give to a, to a teenager at this point that you think would be helpful, pa Bill, Pastor Mark? I, uh, I want to share uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, the second letter, uh, chapter 10, verse 12. He says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. I think that's a lot of the pressure that uh, teenagers feel like, I feel like I have to commend myself. I, ha I feel like I have to elevate myself uh, to, to match, to, to measure up, right? Yeah. And he said, uh, we don't dare do that. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not nice. wise. And so I think some relief to the pressure would be, listen, wouldn't you rather be wise in God's eyes? Because that's really the truth. Right, that's really reality. And I think when you opened up, Bill, and you started talking about social media, and you spend so much time in that, your sense of reality changes, it of what's does, really it? real. It and does. I think you get so sucked into that, that you're like, wow, this is the world. Like, if I don't have enough likes, or as many likes on something I say, mm -hmm. as somebody else, and now all of a sudden, you find yourself into this comparison mode. And rejection. Exactly. Oh, yes. Exactly, and the feelings of rejection. And so when someone feels rejected, anxious or depressed, they're like, I don't dare try to commend myself because I don't feel that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And then they start to feel less and less and less. Mm -hmm. And Paul said, you know, don't be wise in your own eyes, be wise in God's eyes, I think mm -hmm. is the advice here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big things you remember when we're talking about teenagers, we need that, I, I know we're trying to address the teenagers that have asked the questions, I'd like to address the other teenagers that are their peers and remind them that one of the two most important commandments is love your neighbors, love yourself. And by doing that is we're supposed to have our actions to build others up to their benefit and not bring them down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Billy might is, not be able to run as fast as I can, but hey, he's doing a great job trying. But this is the way some people feel that they can feel good about yeah. themselves True. is that they're putting everybody else down. True. So what about that? It's, you're going to have that no matter what in life. But if you have Jesus Christ in your life and he's walking with you, he'll help you through that. And I know it's an easy, easy out answer to a question. Well, put lab Jesus in your life. But as Mark said, <clears throat> once you do, it makes life so much easier. And you can turn to him with anything. It doesn't matter if it's a third degree felony or if it's you stole somebody's candy. If you can turn to Jesus Christ and ask his help, he will help you through anything, no matter what it is in life. Whether Cheers. it's a bully or whether it's something terrible, he's there 24 seven. Right. Bill, well, I'd like to share a scripture. It's Isaiah 26, three, and it says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. And so as the mentors and the parents and anybody else, I think it's a good reminder to have the teens to focus on God's word, meditate on God's word. And those that are mentoring, those that are discipling, you know, emphasized by maybe sending them scriptures, you know, and uh, just saying, hey, think about this today, this scripture, and see who God says you are and not w listen to what the world says. You know, like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says God, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to bring to you an expected end, a destiny, a plan that he's got laid out, you know, yeah. share with them the word of God. All right, well, listen, we're gonna come back. One of our pastors around this table used to be an atheist and he turned to Christ as a young man. And I wanna hear what he has to say. I think you young people that are watching, stick around. You're gonna, you're gonna really enjoy this. We'll be right back right after this. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion.
All right, we're back and glad you could stay with us. Pastor Cameron is the one I was talking about a moment ago who um, was an atheist before he uh, qualified before himself. Show, to actually. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a heck of a few minutes. <laughs> but in any event, you as a young person mm -hmm. decided to be an atheist, but you got saved in your youth. Mm -hmm. What did this do for you when, you when you found Christ? And what was it like even before you found Christ as a, as a teen? Well, I, I guess just sort of a, a, a brief background. I, I became very curious about the Bible. I was raised in a, in a non-religious household, I guess, just to put a, mm -hmm. a sheen on it. And became very curious, didn't get a lot of knowledge from my parents because they didn't really know the answers to the questions either. My dad passed away from a heart attack when he was 44. This was two weeks before I started high school. Mm -hmm. And from that, I just, I just sort of, I, I was not interested in, in anything that God had to say to me or figured that something like that that would happen to somebody if God would cause it, mm -hmm. then there is no such thing as God. It's a whatever. Um, but God continued to work in my life, even in my rejection of him, and surrounded me with friends, surrounded me with uh, people who went to church, who were willing to tell me about these things. And my, my freshman year of college, I, I accepted Christ in, in, uh, in my bedroom with a, with a friend of mine who had been discipling me, as we put it earlier, in that. And it's... It's almost as if a, for me at that time, like a light switch went on. I felt kind of a, a lifting of burdens that I didn't necessarily know I had. It's kind of like when you, when you feel like you're weighted down, but you don't realize it. And then the weight's off. You're like, oh, oh, well, this is what it feels like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just kind of being able to, to have that experience. But I, I get the the idea that you don't believe. I get the idea that you're skeptical or that there are questions you don't have. And, and you know, I, I get it. I understand that. And I think that there's a certain element of when you're struggling with these questions, regardless of, of what they are, and I know we, we've had a list of them and they've had you've been pointed out, it really comes down to what is the, the posture in which you are coming to these questions. You know, the, the idea of having to nail down every single... A jot and tittle as far as what was historical and what was factual and that kind of thing. That's a relatively new experience. That only goes back about the last, uh, you know, 200 or so years. But trying to understand, like, what really is true, mm -hmm. uh, what really is, you know, factually accurate, what is like going on. There's, there's a lot of things that go into that. But for me personally, God worked in such a way and there was no background that I had at all. You know, I had mm -hmm. a I had what I felt like was a, was a near-death experience on a ride at an amusement park. And if I thought I was hurtling to the ground, I yelled the only thing that came to my mind, which was Jesus Christ. No kidding. Yeah, I had no reason. I could, listen, I was raised by a sailor, okay? There were any number of other things that could have come out of my mouth at that point in time. <laughs> but they didn't. God's name came out. Mm -hmm. And that just that bothered me so much because why would I say that? Why would I say his name of, of, of all the other names? And just through that process, God began to show me who he was and what he was like and, and continues still to this day. This is 20 odd years ago. Is still revealing his character to me, is still molding me and shaping me into being more Christ-like. But it's, it's that relationship, it's understanding more of who he is and what he wants in my life and realizing that it's, it's not all, you know, good times and sunshine, that there's tough times, but oh, God yeah, will bring you through yeah. it. And there's, and there's difficulties, and, yeah. but God will bring you through it. I talked about I struggle with anxiety, but God brings you through it. And just realizing that there's so much more to Christianity than making sure your facts are right. Yeah. And I think that's important to understand and to be able to realize. I think, too, you know, one of the questions that uh, we have here um, that, that young people are asking is, is Jesus God? Whether they're asking to challenge that or they want proof of that or whatever the case may be. But these are questions that are, that are going through their mind. Uh, that, don't you think they need to be answered? And oh, they most definitely do need to be answered. But and the big thing that I, I try to explain to people in my congregation when they ask those questions, you know, you can always refer them back to the Bible. But I try to remind people that Christianity or faith is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just like relationship with my my parents my father you know when he asked us to do something or told us to do something when we were kids and you'd ask him why and, and his favorite line was because i said so <laughs> and you didn't challenge him you did it because yeah, he said so yeah. the same thing holds true with jesus christ he's our father 
Okay, and when God tells us to do something, sometimes it's just because he said so. There's nothing in the Bible on certain things that say this because of this, because of this, because of this. He is so great and so, so unbelievably beyond our thinking, sometimes there's no way to explain him other than because he said so. You want to add to that? I agree, and I think uh, what teenagers especially are not looking for is just a bunch of words as an answer, mm -hmm. right? I think what's powerful, and uh, Revelation 12, 11 says this, that they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and loving not their lives even unto death. And so I think what they're looking for is, but can Jesus do it for me? I think that's what they're looking for. Like, okay, I heard about this. And one of the questions was, I, I read these stories in the Bible, but are they, they really seem far-fetched. Are they really real? And I think what they're looking for is testimony. Like in Patrick's case, right? Like here's someone who never believed, wasn't raised to believe, but yet, you see what I'm saying? But yet through experience with God, you overcame you were able to overcome. And I think that's really what they're looking for. Like, I don't want to just hear about, I want to hear how God actually intervened in somebody's life mm -hmm. and actually made a difference. Pastor Warren, you were nodding your head in agreement, I saw. Yeah, and just, you know, living it out that, uh, you know, our life should be an open letter to everybody, not just what we say, but how we live. Our life should be a testimony of Jesus Christ. And uh, that's just, you know, how we live preaches so much than just, you know, rattling off the scriptures or whatever, living it out before them. You know, early, early on in my ministry career, I was in children's ministry. And in children's ministry, it's a lot of you are, you are telling God's story and you are putting the word of God into their hearts and their minds. Are they paying attention? Mostly not. <laughs> right. Depends on the group. Like I've seen the first graders, they're on the carpet, you know, just kind of all the gang, whatever. Ooh, lights, pretty. You know, they're not really focusing in, but at least they're getting the word. As they transition into preteens and to teenagers, what you said and what you've said, they start to now they have to take ownership of this faith that they've heard so much about. It becomes that what you said. Who is God to me? I know who he is to you. Right. I know who he is to my Bible teacher. I know who he is to Mr. Patrick, and I know who he is to my parents, but who is he to mm. me? And you spend a, well, I think you spend the rest of your life, really, but you spend those formative years as a teenager, okay, who is God to me? And it becomes not your parents' faith, not your teacher's faith, but it becomes your faith. And, it, and, that, and that has to stick because if, it, if you don't own it, if God does not become real and manifest to you in your life, it's going to be something you went to and heard a bunch of stories that were weird and maybe some made sense and some didn't, but you're ultimately, you're going to go on to some other whatever other truth that you perceive or whatever half-baked scheme that you believe or whatever the case may be, you go away from that and you go away from the truth because you haven't taken ownership of your faith. Okay. You know, what can we do to encourage parents to be more observant of their children, to try to head things off before they get out of hand in any regard? Um, parents are so busy, they have pressure of their own. Uh, they're dealing with their peers and they're dealing with the pressures of the workplace and the pressures of being married. But yet there's still, um, there's that child that is crying out for help, that's crying out for attention. Goodness gracious, just attention can mean an awful lot to a child, am I right? Yeah. I mean, we were all once children, we, we know that's that. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing is not assuming anything, right? But actually being involved. And so not just observing from afar, mm -hmm. but I think just being involved directly and not just assuming, well, everything must be okay. It's quiet in the room, <laughs> right? And not just taking for granted that, wow, that means everything's okay. But actually being involved and finding out what are you into? What are you watching? What are you seeing? What are you listening to? All of those things and just showing that you care. Yeah. It's the same in anything in life. You have to live it with your kids and you may become that gnawing kind of it seems they, they act like they're irritated because you want to be part of their life mm -hmm. but on the same token as, as Bob said if you live your life as Christ mm -hmm. it's going to come through to the children they're going to they're going to appreciate that and your involvement is what they want they don't want to be alone right. they want people to care about them even though they complain 
They want you there. Yeah, yeah. And then what's the role of the church in this? How does the church step in to minister to these kids? Well, when it goes clear back to when they're baptized. You know, we challenge the church at baptism that, and we ask them and they have reaffirmed that they will help raise this child in the faith, in the Christian faith. So as we do that, it's our job as the church family to be there, live our life as Jesus would, and to reaffirm those kids, be part of their life, encourage them not to knock them down, but to keep lifting them up. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, Parents are the primary disciplers of their kids, regardless of what age they get to. Prim mm -hmm. Well, I mean, until they're adults, obviously, but right. parents are the primary disciplers. And I, I, along with that, which I agree with, I think our, our job also is to come alongside those parents and, and support them and help them in any way that we can. Because, and, and to help the parents understand and equip them for that because sometimes you have churches and you have parents who's like, well, I put my kid in Sunday school and you guys are supposed to put the Jesus right. on them and that's okay. Like, no, it's your job primarily. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the children's minister, the youth minister, they come alongside you, they help equip you to be able to disciple the, the kid because they're with you a lot more than they're with me or with us. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also, I think, a primary function that the church should also serve. Yeah, you were going to add to that? I think that uh, the parents needs to be intentional. You know, just like you've heard a lot of husbands and wives being intentional to have date times, you know, and I think the parents need to be intentional to have the time with their children, whether it's individually or husband and wife, being intentional to have that time with the child to let the child know that, hey, we're, we're concerned. We're, you know, we're, uh, we're valuing your time. We're, you know, we want to focus on you and you know let the child know that they are important and take that time to be with them you know i saw on television not too long ago there are programs that can help young people prepare for college young christians because by the time they get to many college campuses uh, the enemy of their soul is there to try oh, yeah. to take out of them what their parents have put in them all these years. That's right. Yeah. Would you say that's necessary too? I would, and I want to tether off what Patrick said a little bit too in the Titus 2 model where the older women teach the young. Because, listen, especially as young parents, they don't necessarily know all the right things to do. But, listen, those people, those parents that have been through it, have raised people through it, and even learned through failures, right, can help teach. And I think it's the same thing as far as the church's response. I think the church needs to help the church, mm -hmm. honestly, become those parents that God designed in the mm -hmm. first place. And what better, uh, what better teacher is there than experience, honestly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would ask for another comment, but we have less than a minute to go. So, <laughs> But I th that's, that's a topic that, that, that is a real burning issue with me when you just imagine that by the time that, that young Christian gets to college campus, the other types of doctrines that are given to that child, that there is no God and the like, and we've got to do what we can to protect them. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I certainly hope we have helped some young people as well as some parents and, and, and ministers and others today in our program. We thank you for being with us today and ask you to please keep those cards and letters with your questions coming so that we can put those before the public. That's our program for today. Until next week, I am Bill Harris. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.